enduring progress will only be achieved through the collaborative efforts of women and men. Our senior officer in Afghanistan is a woman. Two appointments ago, it was also a woman. That woman is now a general. We have increased the number of... We've got a woman as the commandant at the Royal Military College for the first time in 102 years. We celebrate that as a victory. Hey, good morning. Welcome uh, this morning. What a great opportunity. Um, it's my pleasure this morning to open uh, what is a forum that will, I believe, be um, the turning point of a number of things we've been trying to do in the, in the uh, Gender and Disaster Task Force. Um, for those that don't know, uh, there's a small group of us, and when I say a small group of us, it's about, uh, I think, about 18 now, Susie, that uh, meet on a regular basis to um, start to get the discussion moving. And I say the discussion, but also initiatives this year will be really important. So both uh, Susie Reid here and myself have got the opportunity to joint chair um, what we're doing, and uh, it is a, it's a great opportunity. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Elizabeth Broderick, who is um, married with two teenagers. When she's not occupied on this very demanding front, she has a number of other roles. Elizabeth is an amazing woman, a role model, a leader in equity and uh, gender. And here's a list of a couple of the other things that she keeps herself busy with. She is Australia's Federal Sex Discrimination Commissioner. She has overall responsibility for advancing gender and equality in Australia. Commissioner Broderick has a key, is a keen advocate for Australia's first national paid parental leave scheme, increasing women's workforce participation and recognition of domestic violence as a workplace issue. She has promoted change to the Australian Stock Exchange corporate governance regime requiring all publicly listed companies to set targets for women at board and senior executive level. We like that. She has brought together Australia's senior male leaders from business, government and the military to form the male Champions of Change group. Elizabeth is currently on this incredible list leading the review into the treatment of women in the Australian De Defence Force. She's a member of the World Bank's Advisory Council on Gender and Development, a member of the University of Technology Sydney's Advisory Board and the Victorian Health Advisory Board and Supply Nation. She is a busy wo uh, woman and we really welcome and thank you for the time today. Hey, David is just as busy. <laughs> Lieutenant General David Morrison, AO, joined the Army in 1979 and graduated from the Officer Cadet School, Portsea. No, to the Royal Australian Infantry Corps. He's a busy man. What will I say about you then? Because I was just given this job. Uh, he was, let's do just a couple to keep you up with Elizabeth. Uh, he was appointed as Land Commander of Australia in December 2008. I was wanting some medals today and I got him in civvies. Became Army's first forces commander in 2009. 2011, he was promoted to the rank of Lieutenant General and uh, assumed his current appointment as Chief of Army. We are extremely privileged to have you both here today giving us this time. And thank you all um, very much. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak to uh, this group of senior men and women who uh, lead organisations in their own right, like the Army that is comprised of some of our finest Australians who have taken the voluntary uh, stance of putting service before self. We might defend the nation in the Army, and we do, but your men and women, of course, keep us safe here in Australia from threats that uh, are manifest in our daily lives. So whatever I have got to say in terms of addressing some of the challenges that you and I face, I do it from uh, a, a foundation of deep respect. Now let me give you the context in which I'm addressing you today. I have responsibilities as the professional head of a 45,000 person organisation that is uh, made uh, or embodied under our constitution to defend this nation and its interests. At its most basic, we don't save lives, 
sometimes we have to take them. We are actually at the right hand edge of the spectrum about delivering government sanctioned violence. I make this point up front whenever I speak because I go to the heart of what comprises the heart and soul of our army and I don't want anyone to mistake the fact that I am held responsible by our government for, for producing a highly capable army. And that's the position that I start from. I'm also a 58-year-old Anglo-Saxon heterosexual male who has never been discriminated against in his life. I have no anthropolog anthropological training, I'm not a sociologist, but I have, over the course of my career, and increasingly as your Chief of Army, looked hard at the culture that comprises my organisation. And in doing so, I have found it wanting. 113 years of history, Gallipoli, Tobruk, Alamein, Kokoda, Long Tan, Afghanistan, all comprises not just our history but our culture. My father was an army uh, officer. He joined in 1945. He served for 36 years. Between us, just he and I, we have been putting ourselves in the service of the nation for 70 unbroken years since 1945. And yet, I believe there are systemic problems with our army's culture, your army's culture. It was made clear to me fairly early on in my time as the Chief of Army. It started with a conversation with the woman who's joining me here today, the Sex Discrimination Commissioner, Liz Broderick. It was life-changing, life-changing because she asked me questions about this culture that I had seen sustaining our soldiers in operational theatres throughout my career, that was the absolute embodiment of our military history, and yet had given rise to 13 reviews in the last 15 years about our treatment of women, or men and women from uh, ethnic uh, minority groups, in terms of a workforce that is overwhelmingly male, overwhelmingly Anglo-Saxon and overwhelmingly young. Liz queried me as to why, for all of the, the resources we had expended on re recruiting and retention campaigns, we had throughout our entire 113 years had less than 10% of our workforce as women. The answers that I came to uh, over the course of about a year, having continual discussions with Liz, but uh, other influential Australians, both men but primarily women, and then having the opportunity again at Liz Behest to talk one-on-one -on -one with women who had suffered the outrages of our culture, led me to conclude that army as strong as it is, isn't as strong as it can be. Army as capable as it is, isn't as capable as it can be because we are simply wasting and squandering the talent that is resident in 50% of Australia's population. Indeed, as I said in London several weeks ago, the squandering of women's talent, the traducing of their potential, is a global disgrace. It is evident in your army, and I dare say, and I speak bluntly, evident in your organisations as well. Why is that? I have come to the conclusion that culture is sustained largely through the stories we tell each other. No one alive today remembers Gallipoli, not first hand. There might be some still living in our community who have heard second hand the stories of Gallipoli, but no one was there. And yet the story around Anzac defines your army. But when you look at the story, there are issues with it. There is a level of mythology around Anzac which we will see played out throughout 19, uh, 2015. That rough hewn country boys, hair gold, skin white, who fight best with a hangover, who never salute officers, especially the POMs, can deal it up to the best or worst in the world 
as natural soldiers. Rubbish. There is no such thing as a natural soldier. Never has been. You only get to be a capable military if you look hard at what comprises your force and you respect the diversity that is made manifest through all Australians having the opportunity to serve. If, through whatever stories we tell ourselves, 50% of Australia's population thinks it's not for me, then that talent that I forego as the professional head of your organisation sets the organisation up for failure. Now we see it not just in the stories we sell ourselves but in how certain dominant men within our organisation use those stories as tools of exclusion, not inclusion. You will see that in all of your organisations. When I talk to the CEOs of merchant banks or great mi uh, global mining conglomerations, they tell me the same stories. This is a male-dominated society that we live in in Australia. It's a male-dominated world. All of the women that I'm speaking to now know that implicitly. They've experienced it. Most of the men, and up until several years ago I would have included myself in that if I had had the level of self-reflection I have now, would not have thought about it at all. I once did an exercise with a man called Jackson Katz. He's an American. He does some great work in the theory of the bystander, the person who allows the standard that they walk past to be behind them. He asked a group of men to sit down and consider what they did to avoid sexual assault or sexual harassment during their working day. There was a big sheet of butcher's paper for us to write down the list. The men were your generals, the generals of the Australian Army. And after a period of three uncomfortable minutes reflection, we could not think of one thing. Could you, the men in the audience, what do you do to avoid sexual harassment, sexual intimidation or sexual assault? He then asked the men in the audience to think about what a woman would do. And I took great heart in the fact that your male generals did not have to start reflecting for too long to start filling page after page on what women have to do, where their keys are, where the light is, where their phone are, how they plan their evening, how they plan their confrontations with other people at work, what they say, how they act, how they dress. When I started to think about that, I started to apply it to my workforce. That's the journey that you need to be on. Leaders need to stand up and take charge. It doesn't matter whether it's a voluntary organisation or something like the Australian Army, defined as it is not just by the Constitution but by the Defence Force Discipline Act. You need to encourage and reward not just good behaviour but merit. And merit that is not judged in traditional sense of how did he go. A very wise woman, in this case not Liz, a woman called Avril Henry, made the observation, and it's one that I will leave you with, that men are promoted on potential and women are promoted on proven performance. When you have that unevenness in your workforce and the way you judge merit, if you have a leadership team that is overwhelmingly male and comfortable in that masculinity, if you are complacent about the talent that you are prepared to forego, then you are in a dying organisation. Because I can tell you now, your army is in hot competition with you. I'm in hot competition with the major banks, with law firms, with mining organisations. We have a demographic in this country that is ageing. It doesn't matter what I reap from government in terms of military capability for the future, unless I have a better, diverse, more capable workforce in uh, the future, not only will the army be less capable, but the nation will be inadequately defended. You face exactly, exactly 
the same problems that I do. And unless the men in your organisation at the top are prepared to start thinking about these things and indeed articulating the way I am now, your organisations will wither. It's been a great pleasure, I have to say, to work with the Australian Defence Force and just see the strong, visible leadership that we see every day from fantastic generals like Lieutenant General David Morrison. So thank you very much. I want to acknowledge that we're meeting on traditional lands and pay my respects to Elders past and present. Um, I just want to pick up on a couple of David's points because David's absolutely right. Um, he said that true, true and enduring progress will only be achieved through the collaborative efforts of women and men. And I want to make the point here that women are not a minority group in this country. Women make fi up 50.8% of a population. So to put over half the talent pool to one side purely on the basis of their gender doesn't make good business sense, whatever industry you're in, whether you're in banking law, emergency services, or indeed the military. Um, that, uh, the other point I want to make is that if we just work with the existing structures in each of our organisation and we pour women in and stir, that's not a recipe for change. That's actually a recipe for disaster. Because in all our organisations, the career continuums, the career models are deeply rooted in a male model. And that's not unexpected. The fact is um, we come from a, a very strong male tradition in many of these industries, particularly in emergency services. So today um, I want to really talk about a couple of things. One is I want to talk about the importance of male leaders standing up, as David's done, but really standing up and being visible on this issue. The issue of gender is a leadership issue. Uh, secondly, I want to talk about some of the myths. David talked about the fact that the mythology is often entrenched around um, and created in a different era under different societal norms, but those stories continue through and they no longer serve us well. So I want to identify a few of those myths that I've noticed in the ADF because I'm sure they're myths that are prevalent in many organisations. Um, so if, uh, if you take nothing else away from what David and I are saying today, if you can take these three points away, and that is firstly that the equal treatment of women is not a nice to have. It goes directly to capability and operational effectiveness and I think that's the point that David makes. If you don't understand that, your organisation will wither. Uh, so that's point number one. Point number two is that it is a leadership issue. It needs to be modelled from the top, strong, visible leadership, and that's about men stepping up because it is men who lead. It doesn't matter what organisation I go into, the basic rule applies. The higher up I go, the less women I see. That's as true as gravity and taxes. So that's uh, a second point. And the third point that I want to, to um, really reiterate today is that if you as a leader don't set out to actively and intentionally include women, you will unintentionally exclude them. And that's because of the way systems and cultures actually work and the fact that they are deeply rooted in a male norm. So um, why is cultural change difficult? Why is it slow? Uh, and one of the reasons for that, and if you look at the numbers across emergency services, just the number of women, particularly at senior level, um, I came into my role believing that this maybe was a women's issue, that gender equality was a women's issue, that actually women working with other women was what was going to create change and really all I had to do was to add my voice to open up my networks and that we'd move forward together. But as I looked at it and started to understand more, the fact is when you look at where power sits in nations, where power sits in organisations, it sits in the hands of men. So to rely on women to disrupt the status quo is actually an illogical approach when power sits in the hands of men. Actually, if we want to create change, we need men taking the message of gender equality to other men. That's what will create change in this country. Um, I also started to understand that what we're asking people to do here by moving to a shared model of leadership, a model where power is shared, is we're asking them to go directly in conflict with their gender schema. And by that I mean we all have a gender schema. 
There's good research on this now. The fact is, from the minute we open our eyes and put our feet on the ground, we're looking around. What's mum doing? What's dad doing? Who's caring? Who's working? Who has economic power? Who doesn't? All those things. And we start to develop a gender schema, which is a deeply held belief system about the place of men and women, not just in our families, but in Australian society and, and more broadly across the world. And when we ask people to look to move to a new model of leadership, a new model of organisational culture where power and um, leadership is shared, we're asking people to move directly um, against their gender schema. And so what we need to do is to try and open people up through, I think, through experiential learning. And I just want to um, touch on one of the things that David and I did in the ADF, which I think was a game changer insofar as getting powerful men to step up and say, this is a cultural issue and we need to move forward. Because one of the things that I was able to do was to travel to many military bases around this country. I've been to maybe 60 military installations from submarines under the ocean to you know, C-130s, C-17s up in the sky to actually beyond the wire in Afghanistan. And one of the things um, that I started to see was women would book in and see me one on one. Now, many of them had fabulous stories to tell. I have to say, there is so much that's impressive about the way the ADF has supported both men and women in caring and other aspects of their lives. But I, there was enough distressing stories that I heard, often for the very first time, to make me realise that, yes, it was important for me to hear the stories. I was tabling a report in the parliament. But what was more important was that men who had power to create change in the system heard the experiences of people who loved the military as much as the chiefs did, but for whom service had come at an unacceptable personal cost. And I remember I started with David, I contacted David and said, would you be prepared to come and listen to some of the really talented women that are in your service who haven't had the same experience that you have? And we had a, a, a very uncomfortable first session. I, I remember <laughs> young woman, uh, many of them brought their mothers, but she came into a room, David, me, the box of tissues in the middle, and the reality was how would we kick this conversation off? And it was that courageous young woman, she turned to the chief, she said, Sir, she said, I am so nervous. And David turned to her and said, You know what, I'm scared too, but together we can work out what needs to change. And I thought, look, if it takes a... It takes a courageous young woman to be prepared to step up and talk about her experiences, but it also taught, takes a courageous military general um, to understand that together we can work to change a culture which has existed in the same manner over hundreds of years. So it was a chance at change. We heard the experiences um, you know, of, of sexual assault, of extreme exclusion. We heard and felt what it was like to um, be ostracised from the group because you were prepared to speak out. We heard from mothers who had encouraged their daughters into the service, believing that the enemy lay outside, not within. And it was those conversations that opened us all up to the possibility of change, not just the possibility, but the necessity for change. And I think as a group of male leaders um, and others in your organisations, it's important to get out and hear the stories. Because we can take the data in intellectually. There's a lot of data around, around gender inequality. But what will take us from interest to action is understanding at a deeply emotional level why the current culture is not serving us properly. And I would encourage each one of you um, to go on a similar journey around that to the way that defence has. And one of the reasons I say that to you is because I'm out with your people regularly. I've just concluded a nine-month national inquiry into pregnancy and return to work discrimination. And I've spoken to thousands of women across every state and territory, many of them who are in your organisations. And I have to say some of the most deeply distressing forums and consultation groups that I've run have actually been with emergency service workers. Um, and just to give you a quote of what in relation to pregnancy discrimination, what we find is one in two women has experienced discrimination either when they tell their manager they're pregnant, when they go on parental leave or when they return from leave. 91% of them have never made any form of complaint about it. This is a deeply hidden issue. It's more deeply hidden than sexual harassment, sexual assault. 
And as one woman, and she's a woman from the emergency services, she said to me, this is a couple of months down here in Victoria, she said, look, at the end of it all, I was left with no job, on the brink of losing my home, dealing with a miscarriage, I was left utterly broken. They're her exact words. Um, and that speaks to, in many of the organisations, the difficulty of trying to come back in what we call flexible work arrangement, particularly where rosters are set, you can be called out at any time, there's a lot of night work. Well, the fact is, for many women, they don't leave just before they're about to step up to the summit, they leave about eight years or nine years before. That's what the research shows, and they leave often around the period of childbearing. So in terms of hearing the stories as what needs to change, I think that example of, of opening up, and particularly um, for other men, because one thing I'd say about my, the pregnancy review, one of the most distressing things for me over the last nine months, it's been that many of the discriminatory attitudes against pregnant women and those returning new parents are by other women, often women with young children. Sorry, not young children, women with children. So um, I think as leaders of organisation, it's important to step up, hear the stories, and in, in it, the other thing is that we found you're worse off in a large organisation than a small, and part of that is around the management skills gap. Uh, so I offer those thoughts there. Just in relation to some of the myths, I'll just finish off with that. These are the things that I heard across the ADF. Um, and as David said, this one about um, the mythology that actually changing culture and focusing on gender is in some way making the organisation soft. Um, as people in the ADF tell me, they say our business is about warfare, not being soft to our members. These changes are making us soft. Or this one. If she does deserve to get a promotion, then she does deserve it. But you know, there could be a lot of other males that deserve it so much more and have so much more merit. But because we need to meet the gender goals, she's been promoted over those males that so much more deserve it. Or this one. Um, we've got females in our category who haven't reached the seniority, but they've been promoted. You've got males that have been in seven years and they're not getting promoted. And they've got more experience, but they're not getting it. We're just pushing incompetent females through. <coughs> or this one. As soon as a female makes a sexual assault claim, it's, oh, my God, what happened, darling? You poor thing. Oh, this and that. And there's so many of them, they just manipulate the system. So they're the type of storytelling that actually, when you move through a cultural reform program, they are emblematic of what you're going to hear. But let me just unpack a couple of them. This idea that it's making us soft. I'm not going to spend too much on it because David's really spoken about it. But actually, if you look at um, the traditional recruitment for the ADF, 80% uh, of ADF members are men who speak English at home, so white Anglo-Saxon men. They represent less than 40% of the Australian population. So to think that you're drawing all your talent from 40% of a population you can say you're not getting the best people for your organisation. Not only that, the fact is the military type casts of soldier, sailor, pilot, they're gone. Today's demands for defence, we need adaptability, strategic thinking, working in small groups, outreach to local populations, intelligence, remote work. They're things that men and women are equally able to contribute. Um, so as one member told me, she said, we have to change. Diversity makes us stronger. It is vital for our capability. It's a combat multiplier. And she's spot on when she says that. So it's not about making us soft. I mean, in fact, David, in his address to, in London last month, said, there's some militaries who are now taking substantial measures to address systemic cultural issues that set the values, behaviours and beliefs of those who serve in their ranks. What makes these measures notable is that they are being driven by leaders who want to make their institutions more capable, not by managers seeking to deal with the latest instance of aberrant conduct. And I think that's a really important distinction. You'll come up against the myth of differential treatment. Um, the fact is that undeserving women are taking promotions from more deserving and meritorious men, and I hear that every day. I mean, part of me just says, should I just say, do you really think that the ADF would risk the life of its personnel and its billions of dollars of investment in equipment by promoting undeserving women? 
I mean, you know, that's one argument. The other argument, of course, is that um, the idea that promotions are made on merit, that we work in meritorious organisations, is a flawed idea from the beginning. The fact is merit's a very good principle. It aims to ensure that leadership selection processes are fair and impartial, but increasingly it's being used to actually defend um, what I would say is kind of sexist views in organisations. Uh, and I think we need to really start looking at merit. If you believe in merit, then you should believe in targets because targets are one way of bringing women's merit out into the open. And that's one of the great things that, that ARMY has done. They've actually introduced targets. And then finally, um, this idea that women cry rape all the time, um, you know, false claims of sexual harassment. Uh, it's not a myth that's unique to any particular organisation, but the research shows um, and I'm looking here at a recent study from the UK, it found that just 0.6%, 0.6% of women make false allegations. Um, other research that I've looked at puts that figure at about 2%. So as I say to many people who say to me, oh, it's just women, you know, it's just a cry-rape myth, or she's saying she's been sexually assaulted, or sexually harassed, I say, look, what is in it for her to actually speak out firstly and, and say that? But secondly, ask yourself, is she sitting in the 99% of um, women who are making a bona fide claim, or is she more likely to be the 1% that actually cries rape? And I mean, I think when you look at it that way, um, you see that particularly in the, in the hundreds of stories I've heard from women who have been sexually assaulted, um, that most women don't come forward and they don't come forward for that very reason that they don't think they'll be believed. So there's some of the myths that I think you'll see as you go through. Um, I just want to finish, I suppose, with one observation and that is I think uh, driving cultural change is very, very important in all organisations, particularly organisations that are working so closely in the Australian community um, and that it will require strong and visible leadership um, from, from you know, all leaders, but particularly from men standing up, stepping up beside women and saying, while this issue sits on the shoulders of women alone, we won't mo make progress. So that's why it's up to us as well. Thank you very much. I just wanted to ask about, more about the subjectivity of who determines what merit is. And you've touched on that quite a lot, but that seems to be part of the heart of the problem? Look, we, we've made a lot of changes in, in the Army and indeed in the ADF in response to not just the work that Liz did for the government, but uh, because leaders in the ADF recognise that, that we are well behind the curve here in being a capable and indeed, uh, from an employment perspective, a competitive organisation uh, for the future. And we've set targets for you know, participation rates for women or we've looked at various appointments at various <coughs> rank levels in all of the, the military, uh, the Air Force, the Navy and, and the, the Army, and that's all very good. We've taken great steps to hold people to account. As I said to the public last week, the Army has discharged, discharged, terminated the careers of 300 soldiers and officers in the last two years alone because they have not lived to our standards. <coughs> so this is, you know, I'm deadly serious about all of this, but the best thing that I have done is I've realigned how we judge and perceive merit. In a hierarchical organisation, if you have a very traditional approach to merit, you can only be the Chief of Army if you're male, you come from either the Infantry, the Armoured Corps, the Engineers or the Artillery, and you have done a series of uh, postings and held a series of appointments, all of which are entirely unencumbered by having and rearing children, for example. Early on in my tenure, I sat with a, a very senior woman. Uh, I won't give her name or her organisation, although I'm in, in uh, continual contact with her. She's not connected with Liz in any way. She is, is very senior in an organisation you would all know very well. She was, we were just talking at dinner and I said, uh, how, how many children do you have? And she said three. And I said, how did your organisation manage you and, and the three periods of maternity leave that you took? And she said, every time I came back to work, 
having completed maternity leave, they promoted me. And I thought, what are we missing here? What, what is the merit uh, criteria that we are applying in army that is absolutely trashing an approach such as that? Because believe me, it was well and truly part of our army. We have the best maternity leave in Australia, probably the world. But if you go on maternity leave up until the last two years, you lost 18 months of seniority. And in a hierarchical organisation like an army, like a police force, like an ambulance service, unless you're doing A, B, C, D, E, F, G, you don't get to the next appointment. So now what I have mandated is that we will uh, not just recognise men and women of talent and give them opportunities to do other things outside of their military career, have a child if she wants to, care for a child if he wants to, go and try a different line of work if they want to, if they're of talent and they're of worth to the organisation, they'll come back with no loss of seniority. And if they've missed courses of training while they've been away, we'll bridge the courses. If you don't do something as dramatic as that, they leave. They go and join KPMG or, or the police force or another army across the, somewhere else in the world. I can't tell you, as I've gone into the data, how many talented Australians who you would all like to be uh, confident that they are defending not just the country but our interests, who have left to do something else. Now, reversing that through reapplying criteria for merit, not judging it in such a traditional male way, has been, I would like to think, the greatest change that I will have generated during my time as the Chief of Army. It is. And I absolutely agree with all that. And the only thing I'd add to that is often when we look at a career continuum, we say, oh, it looks meritorious. It treats everyone the same. Well, actually, it's differential treatment that's necessary because we're not all starting from the same base. The playing <coughs> field is not level. So the initiatives that David's put in place by unbundling the career continuum inserting a temporary special measure such as a target or whatever at a different point in time, saying that staff college is open to everyone and not, not particularly preferring those from the arms corps. All those things, which and one level of temporary special measures, are necessary to level the playing field so that then the most meritorious people rise to the top. And that's what you're doing. And, and look, you can expect a reaction to this, OK? There is a phrase at the moment that, that has got currency in uh, the Defence Force and in the Army particularly. You know, a woman being promoted has been broderick <coughs> I, I think... I've said to Liz she should take it as a great compliment. Yeah, right. but, I've but to Broderick. Yeah. <laughs> you will get reaction. Um, Machiavelli, who... Uh, you, you should all read, by the way, he's highly entertaining, or, although, you know, you don't get all that far in contemporary Australia if you set him up as a role model, probably for pretty good reasons. Has a great passage in The Prince, which is, you know, he's sort of magnus opus, that, that, that talks about how difficult it is to be the leader in change. Because you will have as your adversaries all those who are well off and comfortable under the existing order of things. My experience is that uh, as soon as you can convince senior leadership, men and women, of why you are doing something, they, because of who we are in Australia, will get on board. And I've certainly seen it, you know, Victorian Police, for example, under Ken Lay, but, but other organisations as well, you know, men and women who can see the clear benefits to the organisation <coughs> and to Australia, if it's a service, an organisation like an army or a police force, they'll get on board. The younger people in the organisation see the world pretty differently to people of my age. I'll, I'll be very careful about that. Gee, I've become so sensitive as I've <laughs> hung, hung around Liz for the last three and a half years. You know, people my age. You know, younger Australians have less preconceptions around gender, I think, than people such as me. And so they tend to get it as well, notwithstanding some of the comments that Liz gets fed up because they... Well, for a whole variety of reasons, which I won't go into just at the moment. What you'll find, though, is your real uh, implacable but silent opponents, they'll sit at middle rank. 
they're the ones who are comfortable and well off, or they are the ones who feel threatened in terms of career progression by changes that you are affecting. I've got to tell you, you've got to be tough. You've got to take time, you've got to respect everybody. I mean that very genuinely. You've got to be out talking. Between uh, the senior soldier in the Army, that's Dave Ashley, the RSMA, RSM, Regimental Sergeant Major of the Army, and me, we have spoken to 45,000 people in the last three years face to face. Taking him through the thinking, why are we doing this? And it's not just been video messages, it's been small groups or large groups. But in the end, you will find that there will be people who will just resist and stand in your way and they are a threat to the organisation's long-term health and they must be moved on. And that's what we're doing. I want to express some concerns about the limits of the kind of change you're both talking about. And, and I, I worry a little bit about when the response to we're becoming too soft is to say, is to put the argument, no, no, we're not becoming soft. I think soft is beautiful. I think we need more soft. And, and, and rather than saying that becoming soft is one of the myths we need to challenge, I actually think we need to reclaim soft. Um, I think we need to identify that the culture you're talking about is a patriarchal, masculinist culture, which is, is it, and we need to use that kind of language. I, I can understand why in certain contexts you won't use that language. You know, patriarchy is threatening to men, masculinism is, is threatening to men. You can use that language. But if, if you continue putting the business case for change, the corporate sort of c case for change, we're not really going to get to the heart of it. We're not really going to name the issue. And I think we're talking about, sometimes, we're talking about a transformation of culture which means that there will be a withering of, of the organisational form as we currently know it. And that we should celebrate that withering rather than simply presume that bringing more women in who abide by the masculinist culture and who, who report to the masculinist culture that reproduce it. So, uh, look... I'm <laughs> I know strategically about the language you have to use. I really appreciate, Liz, when you're in the forums like this. You can't say what you really believe at your heart. <laughs> look, I know that. Okay. Boy, but I'm someone who's... You, okay, look, I, I'm yeah. 65 and I, I've been around this movement uh, since I was in my, early, my, my late teens. Yeah. And I get frustrated with the business case for change. I get frustrated with not naming the issues for what they are. And, and I know strategically, I'm, you know, in certain contexts, me saying that is going to put me outside of the debate. But someone needs to say it so to remind ourselves that the change we're talking about is deeply transformational. But, but Bob, I, I agree with you. And, but I can, I can have a conversation with a group of educated and articulate Australians of, you know, vaguely my own age and reasonable expectations that, that they have experienced many of the things that have made me, hopefully, a good and altruistic male, okay? But, and I, could, I, have, I have spent a lot of time as the Chief of Army talking to my fellow Australians who are not in uniform. You know, I, I don't, I say yes to speaking engagements such as this much, much more often than saying no because I believe that it's part of my responsibilities. But I also have to realise that people don't do things for my reasons, they do them for their own, and therefore I need to convince them. Now, my, the people I need to convince, overwhelmingly male, overwhelmingly Anglo-Saxon, overwhelmingly young, and I'll go further and speak frankly here, for many of them, the Army is their first disciplined family that they have ever belonged to. The first time they've actually been held to account in a particular way for behaviour or views or so on. You have got to find the message that they latch on to. I speak about capability. I speak about being more robust, making greater use of talent. I use a particular story, which I won't go into now, around a, a group, a, an exchange I had with a group of soldiers in, in really difficult circumstances in Afghanistan to make the point that we're, we are an army that needs to improve. But because if I frame my language for, uh, you know, a caring, sens sensitive in all the right respects, 65-year-old Australian who gets it, 
I'm not going to actually convince the people I need to convince. Yeah, no, look, I absolutely agree as well. And being a human rights commissioner, I can talk from a perspective of, firstly, if gender equality is my birthright, why would I accept anything else for a start? But secondly, it's feminine and masculine energy in the world and in leadership that creates the most transformation and, and you know, I think the most, the optimum type of organisation um, for an uncertain global future. So I'm absolutely behind that. But I come back to David's. If I'd gone into the military saying, look, gender equality is all our birthright, so what are you guys doing? And by the way, it's feminine energy that's going to transform this army. Like I would have, as one guy said in the first session, you're talking dog's balls. He said gender equity is dog's boys, balls, to qu quote him straight verbatim. And that was a very tame one. So I quickly learnt that if I wanted traction, I had to speak in the language of capability and operational effectiveness. And you know what? That's fine with me because I'll frame it whatever way, provided it's starting to have some rev resonance and push through. So, but I absolutely take your point. And as a human rights commissioner, more so than as a chief of army, it is absolutely critical that I don't lose the language and and actually the understanding that this is what feeds the soul, it feeds our heart. That's why that strategy around bringing the personal narratives to senior men was a very risky strategy. It was risky. And I know you were quite initially a little bit reluctant, is this retelling history, but hesitant to engage because it was outside the normal. But you know what? That's a great example of what you're saying because it was that, that energy, the, the things that happened in those meetings across all the services, that's what's created a change and a deep level of engagement in this issue in the Australian Defence Force. We have got an enormous buy-in now from the senior soldiers of the organisation. That has been absolutely critical because culture resides in the sergeant's mess, not the officer's mess. And they are more traditional than we are. They are more conservative. If you can get them on board, you have this momentum that is almost unstoppable. A lot of work has been done there with great men and women, senior soldiers, getting out and, and getting people's views changed. And, as I said earlier, we have also <laughs> held people to account. You don't live to our values, courage, initiative, respect and teamwork, you're gone. There is no place now in our organisation for people who can't do that. And we've celebrated small victories there too, some of them pu quite publicly. You know, it was a very conscious decision that I took last week to tell journalists that we had discharged over 300 people in the last two years. I'm worried that the, the conversation that I have may not have resonance with my workforce, but I, over this last three and a half years that I've been involved in this now, I haven't sensed that I've lost the army. That would be the worst thing, because there's no one in Australia who loves the army more than me. Um, we've got a fantastic platform here with the Gender and Disaster Task Force and some great leadership from Craig Lapsley and Steve Fontana and others who are here today too. Um, with middle management who are blockers or perhaps even the senior management of some ESOs, do we need to win their hearts and minds or do we move them on? Well, this is all about, you know, from the Army's point of view, this is about Australia's future security. Now, unequivocally, I'm about, first and foremost, delivering capable armies of the future. I live in three time zones. I'm custodian of our history and I command the army of 2014, but it's the army of 2025 that I am most concerned with. And so if people don't understand that we need to make better use of women's talents or men and women from ethnic uh, groups in Australia who haven't traditionally joined our army, they are actually standing in the way of a more capable army. And here, Bob, I'm, I'm not mincing my words. And I don't mince them when I speak to uh, people who are in my service now or indeed who have left. As much as I might respect their service in Vietnam or uh, in the Korea or Second World War, I point out to them that my father joined in the Second World War, fought in Korea, was a battalion commander in Vietnam, was a deeply principled man who understood getting the best talent 
into his army would make for a more secure Australia. And his son is exactly the same. And if you can't live to that, then I'll move you on. And I am unapologetically ruthless. Ruthless. I said I would be last year ruthless in getting rid of this culture that stands in our way of being more capable. And I will not lose that uh, focused, ruthless streak while I am your chief. And I can only encourage the men here to take a similar, but in their own way, individual approach to this to achieve the same. Because as Liz and, both, Liz and I have both said, you are here just like me with the health of your organisation that you have committed your lives to in your hands. And what is the legacy that you are going to leave? This is a leadership issue. Um, and I think, you know, that's a really important point, number one. Number two, it's about disrupting the status quo. And think out of a box when you think about that, because which other country in the world has a sex discrimination commissioner strongly linked to the military of that country? There is no other country. I know that because we work with NATO and everyone else. And in fact, David came with me last year to address the United Nations for International Women's Day. We gave an address um, together on International Women's Day. And, you know, people from around the world could not believe, firstly, that a military chief would speak so passionately about this as a leadership issue, but also that the unlikely coupling of a sex discrimination commissioner and a chief of army um, was what was moving the organisation ahead as well. So think out of a box, um, and I think, you know, just go for it. It's interesting because... When we talk about our sector, and we've we put a bit of a fence around this emergency service sector, because we've actually moved in Victoria to be the emergency management sector, which is a broader one, but we still need to come to this core of what is uh, CFA, MFB, SES, DEPI, including its partner groups, uh, Vic Pol Ambulance Victoria. But it's really critical to understand the community bit, because a lot of our people are embedded in the community. So their behaviours in our organisations reflects where they are in the community. So we're actually very aligned to a whole lot of other things. It's very interesting when we set the terms of reference around this of how we did that because we didn't want to run into everyone else's and try and fix the world. We've got to fix part of the world, but it's part of a bigger world, and that's really important. I was reading the foundation document, which we've um, put together as the Gender and Disaster uh, Task Force, and you, and you read through it about, and it's got, well, I won't read through it all, but it's got things like to transform, to transform, to improve, to achieve. You know, the word influence. We've got to influence the direction. Um, so we've got an opportunity to do some great things, and uh, whether it's whether it's age, uh, you know, we, we will come up about gender versus sexuality and the issues about sexuality in the work. Those sort of things are on the table for us to deal with, and we will deal with them. Uh, and we've we've got some short-term goals and some longer-term aspirations of where we want to take this. So today it's been uh, absolutely fantastic. The timing's been right for this group in the forming storming of where we are, and. Uh, don't think you'll get away with just leaving you today. We'll, you'll probably hear from us a little bit to ask questions and seek direction because that's what we'll need to do. So, so I think if we could uh, show our appreciation to both Liz and David, thank you. Thank you.